Once again, and welcome to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue on in our look at the Sermon on the Mount, and we're talking about the Beatitudes, and we're in that last group here, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, right? Amen. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last week, and if you missed that, go back and watch it. So have your Bible ready, have a pencil and paper, or a pen and paper, so you can jot down some notes or questions. And by the way, you can always send any questions or comments to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you. Or go to our Facebook page, mm -hmm. which is Facebook.com slash In Search of Christianity or Bible Talk. Ta-da. Okay, Ta-da. <laughs> All right. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord yes. God, that we can come together in your word. Lord, that we can gather in the power of your word. And, Lord, that you have sent and given us your word, a light, a lamp to lead us, your Holy Spirit. To lead us into truth. So I pray that your spirit would be at work here today, Lord God, and that we would hear your voice speaking to our hearts. And Lord, we would see wonderful things in your word, and we would grow in you, in a knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Alice and I want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we pick it up. And when we left off in our last study, we were talking about, we're talking about persecution and how persecution is happening. And, uh, you know, in, way back when, in, I think it was just before 200, like 197 A.D., uh, the early Christian writer Tertullian wrote that the blood of the martyrs mm -hmm. is, is the seed of the church. Mm -hmm. And it's been said, you know, that the blood of the martyrs is a fertilizer that makes the church grow. And that's so true. You know, God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and said, devise a plan. He's talking to the enemy. It says, devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand, for God is with us. That devil is an enemy who is always at work trying to get us. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Satan has been defeated. You just need to walk in that truth. We need to walk in the power of God's word and understand this battle is over. Okay? Yes, does it not, can you get killed? You can get killed to death, except for the fact you can't die. That's why Jesus said, don't fear him who can kill the body, all right? And those who are persecuted, Jesus, the revenge on them is up to God. Is up to God. Yes. And, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, Romans chapter 12. But we're not to be overcome by evil. Yeah. We're, to re we're to return good for evil, all right? We're to bless those who curse us. Right. We're to love our enemies. That's in the Sermon on the Mount. That's where we're going with this, all right? It says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven, saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Mm -hmm. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. That's the devil. Yes. Uh, that's Satan. That's the accuser. He who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. Revelation 12, that's verses 10 and 11. You see, we, like the Apostle Paul was, and we, we've talked about so much like in, in this last session about persecution, yes. are called to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And the Greek word that is used consistently in the New Testament for, for, for persecution, for a, a witness, is martyr. martyr. Mm -hmm. That's the Greek, this is where the word comes from. Martyr is the Greek word for witness. But like in the time of Joseph, when he was treated so harshly by his very own brothers. Go all the way back, right? What did God say to Joseph? His brothers, his very own brothers, threw him down into a well. They were going to kill him. And then they decided to rescue him. They picked him out of the well and threw him in, sold him off into slavery. But at the end there of the book of Genesis, what do we find? Joseph says to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Mm -hmm. Genesis 50, 20. 
God will use the things that go in your life, and he will use them for his purpose. What is his purpose? His purpose is life. He desires that none should perish, but all come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? So there's two other factors that are really worthy of note here in the verses we've been talking about. Jesus goes on in this verses that we're looking at, and he says, Blessed are you when people insult you. Now, this is an age when, oh my goodness, so people are so, they, they, they get, a, yeah, they're so offended by anything, so defensive, and they take insult at anything you say. Why is that? Well, the answer is very, very simple. It says in Psalm 119, verse 165, that those who love thy law shall have great peace and nothing shall offend them. Well, the other side of that coin then, logically, is that if you don't love God's word, everything's going to offend you. And that's the time that we live in. People take offense at everything. You know, I, I said in our last session, it's like people think that they're being persecuted if you, know, if you have a bumper sticker on your car about Jesus and people laugh at it. That's not persecution, okay? It's amazing how many Christians can be made spiritually ineffective just by somebody calling them a fanatic mm. or homophobic yes. or too religious. Yes. Or radical. Or radical. Let me just talk about those two things real quickly. People, people have said to me many times that I'm a fanatic. And you know what? Do I take a fanatic? I, I say thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate that compliment. Sorry. Fanatic comes from a Latin word that meant literally inside the temple. And it was applied to people that spent all their time in the temple. Well, how only we are the temple. Yes, we are. It's about, oh, you're too, too religious. Praise God, may I never be too religious. But I want to be conscious of walking in the spirit, living that righteous life all the time. It's all about the righteousness. The this is not a hobby for me, okay? No, it's not a hobby. So it's natural, and I mean that in the most technical sense of the word, to desire. For this is what mankind do, to desire the approval of men. Mm -hmm. To be accepted as part of the group. Okay? This is why, why do you think teenagers want to be different and they all dress alike? And why do you think, I mean, people follow the, the trends? And honestly, think about it. You know, one person goes unshaven for a couple of days or and, and is in a movie, and then all of a sudden everybody's unshaven. Or, because it's like you want to be part of the group, part of the clique. You want the approval of men, okay? That's natural. But we're not called to be natural. We're supernatural. That's right. Well, that's true. So we don't need to be accepted by the group, which is why the Spirit of God moved the Apostle Paul to write to Timothy, be diligent or study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. We need the approval of God, not the approval of men. And the simple fact of the matter is living a righteous life is more often than not not going to get you the approval of men. How, how well did that work out for Jesus? I mean, you can't get more righteous than Jesus. So everybody said, oh, what a wonderful guy. No. They said, crucify him. That's what happened. What Paul taught, Paul lived. That's right. Okay? And later on he would say, write to the church at Galatia. And he said to the Galatians, For I, am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Am I striving to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Galatians 1.10. Mm -hmm. You know, what makes you think you can have both? What makes you think you can please men and please God? It's being in the world and, and, and trying no. one foot in heaven, one foot in the world. You can't have it. I don't know where you are or where you live or where you're watching this from, but I can tell you odds are good that it's someplace in this world. Right. And this world is not pleasing to God. You know, when he created this, he created the heavens and the earth. He, he spoke light into existence. He spoke everything into existence. He looked down and he said, it's good. And then Adam sinned and fell away, and, it, and the earth was cursed because of Adam's sin. It was a stain that only could be washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. But that blood of the Lamb 
You know, it, it came down that course and it hit the ground, but it didn't make the ground holy. No. It didn't save the ground. No. But it'll save you if you trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, shed for the redemption of your sins. Okay? This is not a this world is not pleasing to God. And you can't make it pleasing to God. You know, as we film this now, we're in that election cycle here in the United States of America. You're not going to elect anybody who's going to make this a better world. You're not. Now, am I going to make a political statement? You bet your boots I am. I'm about to. Because there are so many Christians who believe that if we can just elect the right guy, everything's going to be all right. God's going to fix everything. Well, you know what? That's not what God says. And God watches over his word to perform it. The word of God, Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. It is unchanging. The, the flower fades, the grass withers, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Do you really want to see this land healed? God has a plan. And it's not, it's not on getting out and getting the vote out and electing the right guy. God's plan is this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, they'll pray and seek, seek God and turn from their wicked ways, our wicked ways, then he'll hear and he'll heal the land. And he'll forgive. It's not about getting, the, getting those unsaved people out there to act differently. Why would you expect an unrighteous person to act righteously? That's stupid. That, that is stupid. <laughs> But God has every right to expect righteousness and righteous behavior from us because we have been cleansed, purged, blessed are, blessed are the pure in heart, right? That's right. So the answer is for us to do exactly that, humble ourselves, repent of our wicked ways, not, not the world's, and God will, God will act. But we seem to have come up with a better plan. If you believe that, you're, uh, better, you better go have, better dash off, not to, the, not to the voting booth, but to your prayer closet. Okay. If you're accused of anything, let me just talk about persecution and insult, all right? Like I said, Satan is a liar by nature. He's a father of lies, yes. right? And he's the accuser of the brethren. That's what it says. Yes. So if the devil tries to discredit you in order to stop your witness to the love and faithfulness of God. Mm -hmm. This is a test. Okay? If you're accused of anything, first of all, examine yourself. Isn't that what it says? Yes. Examine yourself. You know, don't, don't believe that you are above the ability to be self-deceived. Mm -hmm. Okay? I mean, listen, we are still human. All right? So if, if somebody says that you're doing something wrong, you know, the first thing you should do is say, Lord, is he right? Is she right? Because a possibility exists. If you find out that, you know what, maybe I'm doing that thing that I'm accusing. All you got to do is repent. All you have to do is repent. Because if you're faithful to confess your sin, God is just and faithful to forgive your sin. It's that simple. If that's the case, that's just a serpent trying to put a guilt trip on you. If, it, if you're not guilty of that thing, he's trying to put a guilt trip on you and get you to hide in the darkness. Do not defend yourself. Trust in the Lord. Okay? The Lord is the defense of my life. If I'm accused of something and I've not done that thing, I can sit back and relax. I don't have to defend myself. He'll defend me. He's the defense. Right? And it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. That's the word of God, Luke 21, 13 through 15. And if, it, if something is said that you had done, but you had repented of it, and it's being brought back, that's the evil one yes. bringing condemnation. Right. God doesn't even remember it. Once he's forgiven. That's right. God doesn't remember it. That's in Isaiah 43. He says, not, he, he is the Lord. You know, he is our salvation. He has removed our transgression. He will no longer call it to mind. So 
if, if you get accused of something, it's either it's either going to be true or false, mm-hmm. right? If it's mm-hmm. if it's false, just ignore it and thank God that He is the defense of your life. Mm-hmm. If there's truth to it and you've repented of it, that's what you need to tell Him. Right. Yes, you can have a word with Satan, and you can say to Satan, "You dummy, mm-hmm. that's not there anymore. Mm-hmm. God has removed that as far as the east is from the west. That sin has been cast away from my life." He doesn't remember it. I'm not going to remember it, so I don't know what you're talking about. And move on with your life. <laughs> no, I, yes, you have an enemy. There's no That's doubt. Right. It says in Psalm 3, 3, and I love this. This is also a beautiful song. He said, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Yes. So lift up your head. Mm-hmm. Rejoice. Give thanks to God. Mm-hmm. And by the way, like I said, if there's truth in the acquisition, if there's truth in the acquisition, it's the spirit of God touching you. And he can use that old dummy, all right? So just repent. Right. You will be persecuted. The Lord will deliver you. If you'll stand. It says in Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. You have nothing to fear. That's what Jesus said. He said, don't fear those who can kill the body. You have nothing to fear. They can't kill you. If you have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, you died. died. For I have died and my life is hidden in Christ Jesus. You know, I died. It wasn't so tough. I've been there. I've done that. And if if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, so have you. And Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll never die. It's done. It's appointed unto man to die once and then the judgment. I've died and I've been judged. I've faced that judgment. And Jesus Christ, my advocate, stood there. He took the punishment for my sin and set me free. Praise God. He will deliver you from persecution. Or he will deliver you through the persecution. Okay? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, there's no promise that you're going to escape the tribulations. Only that the Lord will save you from them. Okay, as he did, like Alice said, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm-hmm. You know the story? Look at that, yes. right? Yeah. This is, let me just read, okay? This is from Daniel. I'm going to read from the third chapter of Daniel. He said, Look, I see, this is Nebuchadnezzar. He says, You've got to bow down before this idol that I made. Mm-hmm. And they said, No. They, basically, I'm paraphrasing, but they said, We're not going to do that. God will deliver us. And if he doesn't, he's still God. Okay, you can't change that fact. So they throw him into the furnace. They made the furnace seven times hotter. The people that took him up to throw him in the furnace burned and died. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. You servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was their hair of the head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver this way. Good. Didn't he do the same thing with Stephen? Yes. In the book of Acts, Acts, Acts chapter 7, mm-hmm. they stoned him to death. For what? He was a man who had a heart to serve. That's what it says in Acts 6. The Lord. Yeah. And he's preaching the most comprehensive sermon about the history of the people of God. So the, the religious people took him out and stoned him. They're stoning him to death. But it says, being full of the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man 
standing at the right hand of God. Acts 7, 55 and 56. And then he said, Father, do not hold this sin against them. He showed forth the love of God. Rejoice and be glad. So by now, we should know. Mm -hmm. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 14. You know, Paul wrote, he said, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. Second Corinthians 4, 17. You know, momentary light affliction? Look what that man went through for the sake of the gospel. Beaten, times without number, shipwrecked, stoned, thrown into with the wild animals. Momentary light affliction. It is momentary. It is momentary. It may seem like forever here, but remember, this life is but a vapor, it says. It's but a breath. I've talked to people, and they want to get into argument. I said, you know what? Let's come back in 100 years and have this discussion. It's not going to matter. Now, you may not be around in 100 years, but I have every intention of being <laughs> if time were measured, I'd, I'd still be here. I'll leave you. Because the love of God and the deity of Jesus Christ were shown at the height, the epitome, the apex of persecution when he hung on a cross and said, Father, forgive them. When the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Mark 15, 39. Mm -hmm. I started to say, the enemy, the devil, he can imitate a lot of things. Oh, he can have churches. He can have big churches. He can have big congregations. And they can all come in and they can sing hymns. They can do all kinds of things. They can have, I mean, they can, they have imitations of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They don't have God's love. But they'll have, they listen, they make movies about love. They make they write songs about love. It's not God's love. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? What he can't imitate. You know what Satan can't imitate? He can't imitate giving love in return for hatred. He can't imitate loving an enemy. He can't he's incapable of doing that. And his people are incapable of doing that. Okay? It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know, it says in Romans 5, 5, that the love of God has been poured into your hearts through the Holy Spirit. You, you have more than your love. You have God's love inside of you. You have the power to return love for hatred, to return good for evil, to return blessings for curses. You have the power to do that. And you want to know something? People can't. They don't know how to deal with it. That's, that's beyond the scope of human, fallen human nature. That's how you become a witness to the love and work of God. Yes, and remember, that word is martyr. Okay? We need to get to that place, especially in these days. Listen, we live in troubled times. Like I said in the beginning of this, this study of this verse in our last, last time around, these are incredible times. I mean, I, you know, it just, it strikes me that the persecution that is, that is going on in some places in the world, it's, it, it, it's mind-boggling how so many Christians are being persecuted. And it is spreading around the world. I mean, it's not long ago here in the United States of America you know, that somebody started shooting people, and they said, are you a Christian? They said, yes, pow, they were gone. Alice and I were in Nairobi, Kenya. The day before, we, we flew out of Nairobi. The, the following day was that attack in that mall where uh, 150 people were killed, and they killed the Christians and let the Muslims go free. I mean, we, we have seen this kind of thing. I was in London in, um, uh, I guess, what year was that? Uh, 2005, 2005. on 7-7, mm -hmm. when the, those terrorist attacks took place. 
And I grew up in New York City. I actually had an office right next to the World Trade Center when they were building the World Trade Center. I watched it go up. I watched it come down. I mean, there's such persecution going on. The answer to that, the world has a ministry. The government has a ministry that we don't have. Their ministry is to protect us from evildoers. Our ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. Our ministry is the love of God. We need to be praying for those people. Not, not, not because we like them. Not because they're because they're nice people. They're not. They're doomed for. They're heading for total annihilation. Just, but they're doomed because they were. They are persecuting Christians, just like Saul of Tarsus yes. was doing right. on his way to Damascus. And yet God chose him, saved him, and used him to turn the world upside down mm -hmm. for the Lord. That's right. you, never you don't know. You don't know. You don't the ministry of us Christians, we Christians, we need to be praying for those lost souls. Mm -hmm. I, I can remember years ago, I was preaching in a little Pentecostal church in Mount Vernon, New York, just outside the city. Mm -hmm. And there were a group of women there who went out and they would go out. I'm talking about in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. They would go out into the South Bronx. This is back in the 70s. Bad places. Bad. And they would go out at night and they would hand out tracts to people. And I thought to myself, you know, if you're walking down the, the, in, the, in that time in the Bronx, South Bronx at night, mm. first of all, most of the street lights have been broken or shot out. Yes. That's the truth. And you turn down an alley, and as you look down that alley, you see a bunch of guys standing there with chains and switchblades and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And you look down, you can respond in a number of different ways. Now, the, the fact is, chances are very, very good that your knees are going to be knocking. Okay, but that shouldn't that shouldn't drive or determine your action. No. Okay, you can say, "Oh God, deliver me." You can turn and run, or you can say, "Oh God, deliver me." It's better to say, "Oh God, deliver me," and trust in Him than it is to turn and run. Mm, yes. But I'll tell you what's better yet: yes. say, "Oh Lord, save yes. them," because they are the ones in need of salvation. They are the ones in who are just in danger of death, eternal death. You are not. We need to be praying for our enemies. We need to be loving our enemies. Now, if God says, revenge is mine, saith the Lord, he's going to deal with them, okay? It doesn't go unnoticed, and it doesn't go undealt with, but that's not our ministry. Our ministry is to witness to the love of God that people might be reconciled, that they might realize that they can come to God, regardless of what they're doing. There is nobody so evil who is a jihadist that he could not turn to Jesus Christ and say, forgive me. Right. There's nobody like that beyond repentance. I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. And if you do, you better pray about that. Mm -hmm. God, give us the power to love like you love. Lord, that you who knew no sin became sin for our sake. That you who were without any fault. Lord, that, that the Father approved of you. That even the Pharisees couldn't find fault in you. That Pontius Pilate said, I find no guilt in him. And then the people said, crucify him. And Lord, you went to that cross. Nobody took your life, but you gave it. And you hung on that cross and said, Father, forgive them. Father, I pray that that same love that is in us, that was in your son, Christ Jesus, would reach out to the lost and dying world, that you would use us for the glory of your name in these perilous last days. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't be afraid to be used for the glory of God. Don't be afraid to be a witness, even if you know that the word means martyr. God bless you and goodbye. Till next time, when we'll get into a whole new section of the Sermon on the Mount. Bye-bye.